Now that the introductions are over, um, we can start on the presentation. And I suppose we're here today to discuss CIP, uh, to discuss various aspects of CIP with a background to uh, the removal of chlorine at the farm level, which I suppose has, has, has prompted this. And I, I gave a presentation similar to this uh, to the Winter Milk um, Symposium um, from, for Tagusk uh, last December, um, where the focus was on the removal of chlorine from um, the actual farm uh, side of milk production. So without further ado, we'll have a look at the content we're going to cover today. The introduction will speak for itself, hopefully. We cover, um, I think, all the drop for the cat, which I suppose is a take on the reason we're in the situation we're in, that no matter what we're doing, we always put a small drop extra in just to be on the safe side. And unfortunately, with chlorine, that small drop extra has potentially caused our issues um, with chlorides that we saw in, uh, in, in some of our products like butter and, and so on. Um, so that's something that we cover. The four T's, very important for a successful CIP. We'll go through that. And I suppose all of this in the background of control. So what we're saying really is, look, you have your CIP systems, processors um, have CIP systems right throughout their plants. Um, control is vital for all of your chemicals that you're using, all of your CIP, and more so with a background to the chlorate issue that we have um, we have looked at, uh, so that we don't end up in three or four or five years time with another carryover issue for the chemicals that we have replaced chlorine with. Control, the cornerstone of CIP, it speaks for itself, we'll cover that. Also maintenance from the milking machine to the pack, very important to give you control. And then we look at some of the alternatives. We look at chemicals. We look at the chemical companies that supply them, who are a huge support and have an, a huge knowledge and a huge, um, I suppose, help to give people, um, both in advisory and also in supply. And then we cover water. And I suppose water for the processor is now the area where we still use chlorine. And we look at some of the sources of chlorine that we use. So. Um, it's it's a full 40 minutes, but um, I'll try and get through it without um, you all dropping off at the other side. I start off with a quotation from David Leeson in, in Tagus and Moor Park, and this is something that came to our attention when we um, we give courses with FITU um, and Foodline UCC um, on CIP. And David spoke to us some time back about this, that you know uh, the actual milking machine side of things. Um, was heading for a big change, and farmers were, were were going to have to change the way they CIP'd their milking equipment due to residues of TCM and chlorate. And the removal of that will would significantly reduce the risk of these residues since legislation has dropped the actual specification for them. So David was front and centre, really, um, on the drive to help farmers achieve what they have achieved. So I suppose the regulation, uh, 749, was an amendment of the original 2005 one. And it was basically regarding the reduction of chlorate and TCM uh, in various products. So there's a couple of points to it that are important. Chlorate disinf chlorine disinfectants in food and drinking water. Um, the use of these lead to current situation of detectable residues of chlorate in food. So that was something. They did say in between 2014 and 18, a lot of monitoring was done. And they said, if good practices are used, it is currently not possible to achieve levels of chloride residue compliant with the current MRL. So even if people were following good practice, they were still going to go outside the actual, um, the actual levels. So this came in um, from 1 January 2021. And in fairness, um, through huge effort from farmers, from co-ops, from TAGUSC, from advisory groups, and from great uh, interaction with chemical companies. Um, you know, um, I suppose we've got where we needed to be, right? The, the target for TCM levels in butter has been achieved and is now being maintained. Um, so chlorate, it's very important as well for suppliers of ingredients to the likes of the infant formula business which um, I, I worked in myself for years. 
Um, so very important there that the specification is met and that there are no levels of chlorate that cause problems. So these are a number of quotations that appeared after that winter milk conference. And I think they kind of cover pretty much everything. But one interesting one is that vigilance is required on water quality. It's not just the milking machine or the CIP um, parts of the, the plant that use chlorine, but the water where you would think you don't have an issue. If there is chlorine levels in that water from treatment, they may carry over into the plant and that's something we can look at. So the drop for the cat. The drop for the cat covers a number of things. It's an Irish thing, I guess. We always put in a little drop extra if we're baking or if we're you know, putting out fertilizer or whatever, there's always a bit extra. But the drop for the cat um, has landed us in a number of issues over the years on various things. And also on the chlorate side of things, uncontrolled use of chlorine in milking machine wash chemicals um, has been a problem and has transformed, transmitted to the actual milk, therefore transmitted to the co-op and transmitted to the processor. And it's too late when it gets to the co-op because they can't do anything about it at that stage because it's in the, in the product. So the milking machine side of it, that has been covered quite well. There has been huge steps taken there by all of the stakeholders that I mentioned. And it's a real credit to them that, you know, there's been a huge turnaround and, and, and they have moved away from using chlorine as a, as, a, as a sanitizer in milking machines to other alternatives. On the CIP side of it, with, with plants and, and, and factories, um, chlorine hasn't been a factor really in final rinse water and CIPs for many years. Uh, people have moved away from it many years ago to either other alternatives like kerosetic acid or hot water. And more importantly, if your CIP is very good and good enough, you really don't need um, a sanitizer in your final rinse. But then again, it's product and industry, um, I suppose, based as well. It depends on where you are and what your specification is and how long you're leaving your equipment between CIP. Water treatment spikes, always a good place to get um, a, an overdose of chlorine. Um, municipal water is a great example. If municipal water has high counts, chlorine is put into it. So if you pull water from municipal supply, you are basically <clears throat> taking what they give you and that may actually spike your system. So your free chlorine then goes, goes very high and there's a potential to carry over. And it's all down to control and monitoring. Control and monitoring because this is all about safety. It's all about safety of people working in plants and working in farms and so on, but hugely about food safety and about, um, you know, the safety of people who consume that food. So cleaning in place, what is it? It is something that was developed in the 1950s to stop people having to dismantle plant and physically clean it with brushes and, and vats and so on. It is basically where you are using the existing processing equipment, normally at a, a lot higher speed, normally around double the speed, to pump water and chemicals through it and give you a clean plant fit for production without having to dismantle. It is inherently a safe process because it is contained and it is normally very well controlled from an operating point of view. Where the focus needs to come is controlling what we use in the actual CIP, uh, the chemicals, the water, and so on and so forth. So very important, an integral part of most plants, of all plants that actually produce food, uh, certainly in a liquid, a liquid state. Um, and <clears throat> it should not be a fire and forget process. It is a process that starts at the beginning of the process, not something that happens at the end. Good example is you will always put your plates, well, hopefully, into your dishwasher at the end of your meal. But you won't start the new meal without a clean plate. CIP is very similar. It is a prerequisite for the production of good quality, safe food. What impacts it? There's a number of things impact CIP. We will talk about the four T's in a minute and they're sometimes called something different, but in the courses we give, we stick to the four T's because it's very, I suppose, uh, people remember it, it sticks with them. And once you stick to the four T's, you really do get a good understanding of CIP. 
It's affected by a number of things. Design and layout is something that's considerable effect on CIP. Whoever supplied your CIP system first day, be it one of the big suppliers like SPX or GEA or Tetra Laval or somebody like that, they will have put in a system at the time which was fit for purpose. Over time, it can change, which is why on the validation of CIP, it's very important to actually walk the system to see do you still have what you are supposed to have. Also scheduled cleaning regimes. At certain times in industry, in the dairy industry, there's serious pressure on with supply. You have tankers of milk waiting to come through. So cleaning needs to be scheduled. It needs to be scheduled based on quality, not so much on lack of operational efficiency. Now, if lack of operational efficiency comes um, before you lose quality, fine. But the critical thing with CIP, it is a quality enhancer first, and it is an operational efficient enhancer second. Um, correct cleaning equipment, chemicals, and so on. Very important. Procedures, that everything is actually running as it should be, and the people are trained and know what they're doing. And product run times pre-CIP. The one thing that actually really affects the effectiveness of CIP and the efficiency of CIP is the product type and the runtime. So if you run your product, your heaviest product, for the longest time, giving you burn-on and pasteurizers and so on, you will really need to have a CIP that can handle that. And that's your validation. That's your worst-case scenario. And that's very important that your CIP is well able to handle anything that is traumatic. Training is hugely important. It is something we haven't done enough of in the Irish um, food industry over the years on CIP. And a lot of that is down to the fact that CIP has become very automated. And we tend to depend on that as opposed to operator knowledge and management knowledge of it. So a good CIP and an efficient CIP will depend on how mechanical, thermal, and chemical processes work in conjunction with each other on, on different types of soil. The four T's, what are they? <clears throat> it is a very solid structure. It is made up of titration, which is the strength of your chemical. Turbulence, which is the actual scouring action of your chemical and your water and your liquid on your CIP through the system, which gives you that, um, that, that, that scouring action to remove um, deposits uh, and, and it takes you away to turbulent flow from laminar flow of your operation. So on, on CIP, you need turbulent flow to give you that uh, scouring action, which helps the chemical remove. It helps the temperature penetrate and the water to give you that removal. Temperature um, is very important. A lot of, 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 of um, advances have been made with blended chemicals that operate at lower temperatures. And some chemicals, like parasitic acid, require a lower temperature to work successfully, and we can we cover that later. And time really is the critical one here. You have to give the process time for all of these other three strands to work, and that's very important. This is a kind of a, I suppose, a, a standard um, CIP. They come in a tree section, a five section or a seven section, depending on where you're at, depending on whether or not it's an intermediate CIP, where it might be a mini CIP, where you just have a pre-rinse, a caustic circ, and a, a final rinse, or a, a more robust CIP where you have an acid section in it, or a section where you would actually have a sanitizer at the end on certain CIPs. But they, they generally all run the same principle. Your pre-rinse is actually something that is takes away all of your gross soiling. It is normally in the food industry, dairy industry, preceded by a recovery of product, which is very important because you don't want to be pushing, you know, hundreds of liters of milk or product down the drain uh, at the start of your CIP um, because realistically you're losing money and there's no need for it. So your pre-rinse in, 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 in all cases, especially if you're using it to push product, needs to be of high quality and good quality water. Um, some companies use pre-rinse, which is the previous final rinse, which saves a lot of money. And if it's the final rinse, it, it is normally a very good quality because that is the interface between your next product run. Caustic circulation 
depending on whether you're using a standard caustic or a, a blended caustic or blended caustic mix, um, will remove the organics, the proteins and the fats. Um, normally runs at about 80 degrees centigrade. And this really is, um, I suppose, the first chemical introduction to your CIP. And it will remove, I suppose, all of your soil apart from stuff like milkstone and, 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 and we'll say deposits of calcium and so on, which is the remit of the acid. Your mid rinse just removes the caustic so that it doesn't actually, and any residues that are left of soil, so that they don't affect the acid circulation. Some companies will do acid circulation once a week, once every two days, once every four CIPs. Others, especially in hard water areas, are dealing with, 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 um, with products that have high minerals in them, which will do it every CIP. Final rinse is what we're going to be focusing on, really. It's the interface between the end of CIP and the start of production. And it is where you can get your carryover of chlorine or parasitic acid or whatever you're using as a final um, sanitizer, if you're using one. So the 40s become 60s because you add technology. So you really have to have a fit for purpose uh, equipment to perform CIP. And training, everybody needs the same understanding. They need to be on the same page. Your turbulence, you need to be over 1.5 meters per second to get turbulent flow. Titration, not too high, not too low. Too high, you're wasting chemical. Too low, you're not doing the job. It's a bit like washing dishes, right? You can put in all of the, the actual uh, bottle of washing up, washing up liquid, and it won't make it any cleaner, but it'll take you half the day to rinse it. Or you can put in just a little bit, and you still won't get it clean. So there is a sweet spot there with titration, and it is an area where you can lose serious money on CIP by overdosing. And also, if you overdose and don't rinse, you can get carryover, and that's where the control comes in. Temperature adapted to the process. It depends on what you're using. Some blended chemicals use lower temperature. Normally, 80 degrees centigrade, there are about for the caustic, and probably 70 for an acid. And your rinse waters can be hot or cold, depending on the requirement and what you're adding and what you're trying to remove as well. And time is dependent on the size of the circuit and also on what chemicals you're using. So successful CIP is a quality improvement. It should give you reproducible results every time. So in other words, it should be the same every time. Documentation is critical. It is critical from the point of view of governance of the CIP being able to stand over the CIP and being audit confident when your CIP happens. So you need to be able to produce documentation that shows not alone the CIP happened, but it happened successfully and that you have the proof that it did happen by showing the four T's and how they actually interacted and so on. It has to be economical. If it's costing you more than your product, you're in trouble. You need to look at it from an economical point of view. Do you need to do it as often as you're doing it? Do you need to use what you're using? And do you need to have the length of rinses that you have? They are more often than not where you will make your savings is length of rinses because people put in a drop for the cat, an extra drop of rinse water, just in case. So sometimes that just in case is huge and you need to look at it. They have to be safe. So leaks, uh, maintenance, calibrations, very, very important with CIP. So you might ask yourself, why am I putting a Pirelli banner up there? It's not because I like Pirelli, I like Formula One, definitely, and Pirelli are a big player in Formula One. But it's their slogan that makes a lot of sense to me on CIP. Power is nothing without control. So you can have the best CIP in the world giving you a really good clean, but if it's variable and it's not in control, um, then you can have problems. Ways of actually Making it controllable come in the form of validation. Every CIP should be validated. And a validation really is something I went back to earlier on, where you're taking your process and you're actually ensuring it can handle the worst case scenario you can throw at it. So your, your most viscous product, right, after your longest run, at your highest temperature, in your furthest away tank, on a cold Monday morning in January, and that tank might be outside and jacketed. You need to ensure that your validation happens on the worst case scenario. And that might be something that you get historically, that you know what the worst case scenario is, or something you can predict. 
that will actually be made clear to you by verification. And your verification is a snapshot of a CIP occasionally to make sure it's working. It's your OQ. It's, is it doing what it says in the tin? And that is tied in with the daily monitoring of a CIP, ensuring that you're not getting alarms, critical alarms, ensuring that you're using the same amount of, of, of water, ensuring you're the same amount of chemical and so on, and that your swab results are your ATP or whatever you're using, you know, you're not getting spikes. And any change on a CIP system, even if it isn't validated, should be handled through management of change. There should be a management of change process that allows you to change something if it isn't a like-for-like -like change. So if a pump goes in the morning on the CIP center and you were able to put the exact same pump in to replace it, job done, no issue whatsoever. But if you actually have to put a different pump in there, <clears throat> number one, you will change the profile of your CIP. Your turbulent flow could change. But if it's something that you need to do, then it needs to go through management of change. If you want to change pipe work, if you want to recite uh, a probe that's on a system that's been validated by the, the actual supplier uh, or yourself, well, that's a revalidation, but it also entails a management of change process where other people, other departments have a say on the decision you're about to make. So validation verifies the effectiveness of cleaning um, and it gives confidence to both um, regulatory bodies and to customers that your CIP system is in control. It documents evidence that even on the hardest CIP and the worst potential CIP, you are in control. And it basically demonstrates that you are brilliant at the basics because CIP is a cornerstone. It's a basic process that you are prerequisite need before, <clears throat> excuse me, you go into operations. So I've given three examples here. There are many more. I've given an Ecolab example, a, uh, a Wartech example, and a diversity example. Um, so there are many, I'm sure there are many more. And these are control systems that, you know, CIP uses. A lot of the problem with CIP today and some of the more modern plants is there's data coming at you from all angles. You know, the SPXs and the GAs of this world, when they come and put in a CIP, they're putting in the top of the range um, control systems. So the top of the range control systems gives you a, a huge amount of data. And that data is important to various people. Your automation engineer will want that data to do certain parts and certain things. Your, your maintenance people will want that data you know, to, when they're, when they're uh, calibrating. Um, you know, there's other quality will want that data to see some things. But the operator and the operations group want data to show them that they are doing the CIP correctly every time and it is successful. And the, these offerings from these companies give you that. They give you a bite-sized piece of information, a dashboard, if you will, to show you control and if you're in control. And they are very, very important to talk to them if you already are dealing with them you pay a lot of money to these companies to supply chemicals and they've gone from the kind of chemical supply angle to um, actually supplying advice and so on and I think that's that's very important on a control viewpoint so if you evaluate the parameters for control conductivity temperature flow and time there is a supplementary um, I suppose performance monitoring suite that you can use as well and it's hard to beat it. Visual inspection is absolutely critical. You can do it in some CIP. You can look into a balance tank. You can look into a holding tank. You can look into a dryer. You can look into an evaporator from the top or the bottom. You won't be able to look into lights, but you can split a pipe every so often. Chemical testing, very important. You know, conductivity testing, critical. Critical that you do a conductivity test versus your, auto, your probes, uh, certainly a um, couple of times a week, just to make sure you're not drifting. Uh, ATP methods of rapid testing, most co-ops use them for milk tankers, a very rapid way of actually delivering a result on CIP effectiveness, you know, within minutes, you know, and there are numbers out there, there's loads of companies doing this technology, which is superb. And that is backed up then by the full microbial evaluation, the actual swabbing and plating and 48 and 72 hour checks. All of this ties in 
to a package that gives you a confidence and a demonstration of control on CIP. But first of all, you have to understand CIP and understand what it's doing, how it's doing it, and what result you actually want to get from it. To give it that consistency, maintenance plays a huge role. Right all the way from the milking machine, and I'm a farmer's son, not a dairy farmer's son, but I understand um, milking and so on and so forth. And in the old days where you would actually, at the end of a milking session, put on the CIP, or the, the actual circulation, while you went out and took the cows to another paddock or whatever and came back, it could be half an hour, an hour later, and it was still working. And you presumed that it worked, and it was drained and rinsed and so on. Nowadays, control is critical, literally from there, be it changing uh, tubes on a milking parlor, um, changing seals, uh, all the way up along to high-end manufacturing where you have dedicated preventative maintenance, predictive maintenance. And the real small stuff is the stuff that can cause you problems. Seals. Number one, changing seals when they need to be changed, <clears throat> not when they leak. Number two, putting the correct seal in. If it's a DEN fitting, a DEN seal. If it's an SMS fitting, an SMS seal. Not whatever you have at hand. Okay? And pumps. Very important. If you change pumps for some reason, pump burns out, and you actually replace a, centri uh, um, a return pump, if it's a liquid ring pump, with a centrifugal pump, you will deadhead that very easy. It's critical that your pumps are working efficiently. They're not sucking in air, that they're not leaking, and that they're actually fit for purpose. Because if you change your pump and you don't actually get the correct duty on the pump, you can change the profile of the CIP. You can go from having very good turbulent flow to laminar flow. And it's something that is, is, a, is, a, is an easy mistake to make. Um, I'm going to skip calibrations because I'm going to come back to it. Spray devices, very important. Most of us have tanks in our process. Spray devices are the way of CIPing an internal part of the tank. Ensuring you have the right one, ensuring that your spray balls aren't blocked, and ensuring that you're getting the right coverage. So it's very, very important. As part of your control mechanism, the spray balls are inspected uh, regularly, and that they're able to be inspected. If you're ordering a new tank, that you can pull them, that you don't have to build scaffolding up inside a silo to actually get a spray ball, and that the correct type is in there. In our, 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 um, our training courses with FITU and, and Foodline, we show examples of various different turbines and spray devices, which are critical for cleaning and successfully cleaning the inside of tanks and silos. Program checks, very important. Check the original user specification against what's happening now. And in validation, you have to do that anyway. You have to go through a whole DQ, IQ, OQ, PQ, and a UPS on your system. And it's a great reset for your system because you're going back in there checking that, you know, what you say you have, you have. Nobody has changed anything over the years, and it's doing what it says in the tent. And the chances are it is, if you're not having any issues with it, but it may be drifting very close to the line. And it's a great reset to bring stuff back. Maybe look at some investment, uh, upgrading probes, upgrading, you know, data acquisition and so on. Valves, highly important. Important for a number of reasons. Because they are normally the interface between product and CIP. <clears throat> They're also a huge harborage for bacteria and for soil. So it's very important that the sequencing of those in CIP is controlled and is known so that if you have mixed proof valves that they're pulsed during a CIP, that they're actually, you know, uh, either block, block and bleed or total mixed proof so that you have the confidence that, you know, food safety is at the front of your, your radar. Calibrations, vital. There is no point in actually thinking you're doing the right thing because it says it on the screen if you are out of calibration. Calibrations really are sacrosanct when it comes to CIP because you're dependent so much on flow meters, probes, switches, and so on, giving you the right information. And that is something that has happened over the years. Automation is a great thing. We have automation everywhere. But it actually sometimes gives us a false sense of security. I mean, I learned how to run a dryer from a guy who was running a manual 
Marriott Walker dryer. And everything he did was a manual change to run the dryer. You get a great understanding of it. Whereas with automation, you know, you're watching a touch screen or watching a, a HMI. And, you know, if it's doing it on the HMI, you're happy. And even you may not even be watching it because you know the program is doing it. What happens when it drifts, unless you're actually monitoring, you don't notice it. And I think automation has taken away the need, perceived need, for knowing how CIP works. It's a push button. If it goes green after this or red after this, whatever. We need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to, you know, I suppose, CIP 101. Where, yes, this is critical to have, but it's great to have an understanding of it. Because when it does go wrong, then you have the people who can actually put it right without giving serious uh, money away to various other people and without maybe causing a food safety risk. The cost of CIP drives a lot of optimizations in CIP. And optimizations are good. Reducing water, reducing footprint of chemicals, reducing time. So every time you're CIPing, you're not doing production unless you're CIPing a tank off to the side. But if you're CIPing an evaporator or a dryer or in a cheese plant or whatever, you're, you're basically down. So every time you're down, you're not actually producing. So it's very important that you actually look at CIP and actually optimize it. So you look at this, this pie chart. It's interesting to see that water right, and heating come in at 50% of your CIP. That's a huge amount of your CIP. You'd think chemicals would be higher. But if chemicals are controlled, you know, chemicals are so good nowadays that they are very efficient and they only come in at 8%. Now it's a lot, but it's, 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 it's 8%. So the big focus area in control and maybe changing your process is in water and in heating. It's also the, the safest and the easiest. So with chlorine dioxide, sorry, chlorine, uh, hy sodium hypochlorite, um, kind of taken off the menu for CIP, um, there are other options. And if you still want to put in sanitizer on your final rinse, there's a number of options. I suppose the one that most people use is parasitic acid or hydrogen peroxide based um, sanitizer, which basically is a very, very good um, sanitizer, very effective and leaves no chemical residue, provided it's actually controlled. So that's very important. Um, it's a little expensive, and it, it can be corrosive as full, full hydrogen peroxide. Chlorine dioxide is another one. Ozone is one that's becoming, I think, going to come on our radar and certainly coming up along there. Parasitic acid is the one that farmers have changed over in most cases now too, and a lot of companies use. And it's very effective. Um, it's nearly as effective as ozone. Um, but there is a handling issue with it. It, it. it is very pungent and it can be very corrosive to hands and so on from a safety point of view. Plus, it leaves a very pungent smell if you're using a CIP. But it is a very, very good uh, sanitizer. Hot water, where available, uh, is also an extremely good sanitizer after final rinse um, and can, can be used and is very cheap, provided you have a, a good source and a good generation of it. Again, ozone is something that, you know, especially the ozone CIP project which is co-funded by the European Union's Life Environment Program. A lot of work's being done on that. Very good as an antimicrobial agent, and is something I think is coming down the track. To the point where I found a piece in Farmers Weekly some time back, where some farms in the UK are using on-site ozone generation, um, and it actually removes a lot of their, um, their their sodium hypochlorite or their parasitic acid on farms, and it looks like it's 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 going to to to, to become more and more popular. I want to talk a small bit for the last five or seven minutes about um, CIP on site. It's very important for companies to have a CIP champion, somebody who knows the CIP, somebody who can be asked about a CIP, and somebody in the case of an audit who can stand up and defend and actually, uh, I suppose, talk about the, the plant CIP. I've been that person at times where an auditor has come in, opening meeting, the parcel is passed around the table about CIP. Who is your CIP person? Your CIP person needs to be a dedicated person. It can be a full-time uh, position, or more often than not, a part-time position with an operations person, engineering person, or a quality person. But you need somebody who can actually talk about your CIP, the history of it, 
what happens now and get the data when required, be it an internal audit, be it an external audit, or be it a customer audit. Very important that there is a dedicated person, that there is a management team, which you'll need anyway, for you doing your validation, and that there is senior management buy-in to the importance of CIP and how critical it is when you're dealing with, um, dealing with it. We have great resources from our chemical suppliers in this country. Biocell, Water Technology, Diversity, Gouldings, Brintag, Halkem, uh, Ecolab, Microbio, all there, and loads more. And these people, um, you know, have played a huge part on the reduction of, of issues on the actual farming side in conjunction with the co-op advisory and so on. But they also play a huge part day to day on supply and control and giving advice on CIP in plant. One thing that I suppose really needs to be looked at is water. Water is universal solvent, makes up 90% or 95% of chemical solution. It's an area where we could get caught because we still need to chlorinate water. We still need to sanitize water for use. And what you have here is your standard water supply, um, all of your treatments going through it. And your pre-treatment is very important with water. Chlorine demand can have a huge um, effect on, on water, on water quality. So you'd be adding more chlorine if, 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 um, if you have um, total organic carbon, high levels of it. The variability of quality. So, like I said, if, if you're using a municipal supply, it bounces around quite a bit. Therefore, you're actually um, getting in more chlorine some days, more chlorine in the water and less chlorine in others. Turbidity, microbial challenge, in other words, um, because more effective removal of microorganisms upstream, uh, it actually helps you with chlorine. So you need to reduce your chlorine. And the pH value um, is very important as well. So these are items that actually affect um, you know, chlorination. Sodium hyperchlorate um, is used in water disinfection. Um, it can contain uh, bromate, chloride, chlorate, obviously, and perchlorate. And due to decomposition, this has been a problem in plants where volumes of hyperchlorate are brought in. Over time, they decompose, form chlorates, and then because the strength has reduced, you're adding more to give you the chlorine level and you're adding more chlorides. So other solutions are required for water. You can still use sodium hypochlorite for non-food uses in plants, like cooling towers, like, like general purpose water, and so on. But a lot of companies have changed over to on-site hydro hydrochlorate, or on-site chlorine generation. And this is a great solution, and you're making it up from salt, from water, cracking that bond, and giving you fresh chlorine. And that is very, very good because you're not getting chlorates and you still can use it for your, your water. Chlorine dioxide, where we're breaking down hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride, on-site generation, a lot of co-ops and a lot of companies have gone to this. Another great way of doing it, of producing chlorine. And I suppose, you know, that on-site generation and that, that chlorine dioxide and ozone and so on, they are a reaction over time to chlorates. Um, the actual specifications are getting tighter and tighter in finished product. It is vital that companies like Infant Nutrition and High End Dairy and so on are able to actually produce a product that is well within specification and, and, and is beyond reproach. So to wrap up, I guess, what we've been talking about for the last 40, 45 minutes now is control. And that's the overarching thing. It's critical from the milking machine to the finished product. And it started, and in fairness to farming, to co-ops and so on, they've made a huge, a sea change there in moving away from chlorine to alternatives. So the start of the process is actually, uh, you know, in control, and it's very important to control the rest of it. So we need to invest in CIP, in plant, in data acquisition, in training. Designate a champion. Make sure you have somebody who's able to stand up and know what they're talking about. Also, able to see problems before they come and become a real CIP evangelist. Be audit ready all the time. Not possible, you say. Not possible because you'll always have to go around before an audit and make sure you are ready. But the morning of the audit should not be the morning that you know that you haven't got the full suite of your CIP documentation. 
you should. It should be there for you and ready to go at any time. And as I say, we're back to control. Control the additions of your replacement chemicals that you've put in instead of certain chlorine. And chlorine will be used all the time in various plants on certain other things. But in final rinse waters, um, you know, it, it'll only be used as chlorine dioxide or on-site chlorine generation. And, you know, I suppose the risk is there if you use sodium hypochlorite, you will raise your chlorate levels. So control is everything, as Pirelli say, and it's, uh, it's something we need to look at. So I hope that has given you, um, I suppose, a high level look at where the challenges are going forward on CIP and where certain processors may need to look at, at, at beefing up their systems. So thank you very much indeed for your time. And uh, I think we're going to take some questions now.